Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is a Ukraine War Update Extra video giving you the tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. So much to talk about, always so much to talk about. It just amazes me uh, that this this war has so many facets, geopolitical facets, equipment, war, strategy, tactics, facets, just endlessly um, interesting stuff. Uh, where should we start? Well, I think it's pretty much going to be a given. I'm going to start with Biden visiting Kiev. It's a very uh, out the blue visit, as you would expect with kind of the security that you would need to have around these decisions. And uh, the idea that it would be very last minute without official plans put in place because you know you need you need to you, you don't want Russia to know that uh, Biden is visiting Kiev and that's for sure. Not only that, actually, you've got uh, Israeli delegation and the Italian uh, Maloney uh, visit, visiting Kiev as well. So really active period for uh, political shenanigans in Kiev. What does uh, what do the socials have to say? White House keeping quiet about how Biden got in and out of the country until Poland trip wraps it up. So already uh, Biden, I think, has has left for Poland to to meet uh, Polish politicians to meet Duda, I, I believe. Um, today's visit of Joe Biden to Kiev is the first visit of the US president to Ukraine in the last 15 years, although Biden visited Kiev multiple times as vice president. We don't want to get into long weeds of that. Uh, U.S. notified the Russian government that President Biden would travel to Kiev, Ukraine, hours before he made a trip for deconfliction uh, purposes, says the White House. Uh, Biden admin only involved in a small circle of interagency officials in the plan for POTUS to visit Ukraine. That's according to the White House. Biden made the final decision to travel to Kiev on Friday after meeting with his national security staff in the Oval Office. Now, I wonder whether this has something to do with uh, the idea that, where is it? I'm sure it's down here. So you've got uh, lots of photos, lots of stuff happening. Um, but actually, it seems to coincide with Wang Yi's visit to Moscow. So he's a Chinese diplomat. Um, and I think to sort of coincide with the anniversary, so both visits occur in the days preceding the anniversary of the full scale Russian invasion to Ukraine. Uh, there's an interesting parallel, I think, there that, that China is visiting Moscow and the US is visiting Ukraine. And there you get a kind of snapshot of what's going on in the world. And we are going to go to talk about China in a short while after we sort of discuss what's been going on. I saw, so I've seen a bunch of video footage of Biden visiting. I have to say, I think Biden is looking old, by the way. Um, uh, he was old when he came to be president, uh, but uh, he's he's not certainly at the top of his physical game. Uh, and I kind of noticed that, I think, with him going to Kiev, just in general, I suppose you could say in, in the public recently. Um, so it'll be interesting to see his whether he'll decide to run for a second term. Um, so this is a Sky News article. US President Joe Biden visits Kiev as he says Putin uh, thought he could outlast us. A Ukraine's president says the pair discussed long-range weapons and described negotiations as very fruitful. In a statement from the White House, the president said that his visit to Kiev would, quote, reaffirm our unwavering and unflagging commitment to Ukraine's democracy, sovereignty and territorial integrity. He added that there will be more sanctions on Russia against elites and companies that are trying to evade or backfill Russia's war machine. Addressing reporters in Kiev, Ukrainian President Zelensky described Mr. Biden's visit as an, quote, extremely important sign of support for all the Ukrainians. Negotiations today were very fruitful, very important and very crucial, he said, adding that the results, quote, will definitely have an impact on the battlefield. Uh, it's all really about continued military assistance and exactly what that will look like. It's all about, I, I you know, I don't waver in my opinion here. I think it's all about long range missiles and the ability for Ukraine to hit Russia behind that 84 kilometer range that's the, the sort of that's a high Mars range official range so the Russians have pulled back all their forces behind 100 kilometers the Ukrainians desperately need to be able to hit that uh, which is why it's good news that Rishi Sunak UK uh, Prime Minister said at the Munich conference security conference that indeed UK were going to be the first to provide long long range munitions to be um fascinating to see what they are, whether they are the Storm Shadow cruise missile, whether they are harpoons, anti-ship missiles, uh, I guess can be used in, in other modes. 
Um, just to return to defenestration, so this is uh, Business Insider saying, a top Russian military official is dead after falling out of the 16th baller window, the latest in a string of untimely deaths. I actually reported this the other day. This is Marina Yankina, who has worked for the Russian Russia's military Western Military District, found dead on Wednesday. She was, I think, in, investigating sort of embezzlement and what they're, they're, there are rumours that it's possibly Gerasimov uh, behind that or whatever. But point is that I don't, and I would say this to to your to pro Russians in the threads again, which is come on, like deal with the data here, right? Do you see this happening in America? Do you see this happening in Ukraine? Like, here are nations that do things properly. And you, if you're pro-Russian, you're really in support of Russia here. And then, well, take a look at yourself. Take a look at yourself either in a mirror or if you're Serbian or whoever you are supporting Russia here. Take a look at that and say, is that what I aspire to? Is that what I want? Which is as soon as someone um, decides to speak against the government or do something that someone doesn't like, they end up being dead. Like... And that's coming, it appears, from the FSB and from the very top. Like, is that... Again, I always ask this question. Like, are you on the right side? Like, really, you're on the right side, the right moral side in this? Because you're not. It's that simple. And this is where I start getting a bit ranty because I just can't believe people come onto the threads and, and attack Ukraine and attack the US and attack the allies of Ukraine. As, as if they're on the moral high ground somehow. And then you look at this, and then you look at a list of all the people that, are, that have suddenly died, and then you go to, like, last week, sacked Russian police general found dead in his in apparent suicide, shooting himself with a hunting rifle. Yeah, because that's, that's normal. It just, it's just... I, 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 there's so much cognitive dissonance going on in this kind of behaviour. It, it does my nothing. So cognitive dissonance or cognitive dissonance reduction more accurately. Cognitive dissonance, I've, I've explained many times. You have a core belief and you have evidence against that belief. And if they if they are contrary to it, in, in contradiction, your brain can't handle disharmony. So you have cognitive dissonance. You've got dissonance in your brain. So what happens? Well, normally your core belief will maintain. It's very difficult to change your core beliefs, right? It's not very often that new information comes along and your core belief just gets changed uh, in order that your new information takes over your core belief. Normally, your core belief will uh, change your the new information. You'll bury your head in your sand. You'll deny the new information. You'll harmonize it to your core belief so that it's somehow uh, integrated. So the core belief for pro-Russians are Russians are the on the moral high ground, the US is evil, Ukraine are Nazis, etc, etc, all this kind of nonsense. And although there are problems with every nation, like there are problems with the US government, there are problems with the UK government, but when you compare that to Russia, the question you've got to ask yourself, right, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting myself, but the question you've got to ask yourself is, when you look back at Soviet history, there are two ways of like having an empire or a union, right? And one is to like, attract people to be part of your kind of group i guess like treat them nicely uh, and they just want to be there or you coerce them through fear and violence to be part of your empire uh, and if you choose the latter you can bet your bottom dollar that as soon as it, it is physically possible to do so or politically possible to do so those countries that have been brought under your sphere of influence by by violence and um the coercion will do a runner, right? So when you look at the breakup of the Soviet Union, the countries didn't hang around and say, "Oh no, we really enjoyed being part of this. Can we just hang around?" Right? Here's the big difference. Here's a really big difference, right? America has been trying to build a wall on its southern borders. Why? Because everyone's trying to get in. USSR built a wall in Berlin. Why? Because everyone's trying to get out. That's all you need to know about. That's like simplifying the whole issue. That like, and I think perfectly well. And and Russia is just like Soviet Union 2.0, right? And it, it's trying to coerce people to stay with it. Uh, and actually, as soon as they have the opportunity, you know, you look at the Baltic states, you look at uh, East Germany, you look at Poland, Czechoslovakia, etc., etc., etc. What happened as soon as they had the opportunity? They all did a runner. That, that tells you all you need to know about how attractive Russia and the Soviet Union are as, like, 
political ideals, right, and as countries that you would want to live in. So people living there uh, harken back to these eras of with rose tinted glasses of like Russian power in the Tsarist uh, M M M Empire or yeah, earlier, uh, or in the Soviet Union, and it's like. Well, when we used to be this great nation, but actually, were you really that great, or was it just that you were using, you know, power to coerce people, and and uh, yeah, it's just, you know, pro-Russian people have to have to ask themselves, like, what are you doing? So I was talking about, sorry, it, back to where what I was talking about. So cognitive dissonance is like core belief is that yeah russia is we are the nice guys we are morally good we we are you know the paragon of all, all that is good and great in the world or whatever or we're better than everyone else and then you have all the evidence comes along to suggest that's not the case people get thrown out of windows the fact that all these countries want to run away from you the fact that ukraine says no we don't want you actually go away all of these ideas. So how do, what what do you how do you deal with the, all this contrary evidence? Because it appears that they're very good at maintaining maintaining that core belief that that Russia is the number one. So the people in the threads, the pro Russians in the threads, they still maintain this. So there's several ways that they can maintain this, which is to, to which is to slag off America even more. So it's not to deal with the fact that they are they have a like a negative situation that that, that Russia is bad that they're killing political opposition they're burning books they're doing all these like really uh fascistic things and that putin does x one z they they flip it so i don't need to deal the way i deal with that is by kind of ignoring that and saying how bad the u.s is so i'm going to slag off the u.s slag off the allies slag off the uk whatever and that that allows me to maintain my core belief by not really dealing with it but deflecting onto onto america so there's that issue then you get how do you deal with all this evidence? How do you deal with the fact that Ukraine doesn't want you to be there and they didn't welcome you with open arms, they didn't welcome you with bunches of flowers? They're all Nazis. That's how they deal with it. It's like we dehumanise them and that allows all that evidence to sort of disintegrate that, and, and that allows me to say they don't deserve an identity and their identity needs to be wiped off the face of the earth because they're Nazis. Uh, and But... Of course, that's highly problematic because they're not. So they they kind of invent invent a narrative that allows this um, contrary evidence to be kind of to crumble away or to be assimilated uh, into their their core beliefs. And of course, you know who are the Nazis around here? Putin's got more fascistic uh, tendencies and characteristics than than uh, anyone in in Ukraine I would wager and so it's cognitive dissonance is about cognitive dissonance reduction so the, for these pro russians in the threads and everywhere else around the internet and in the, and in the world uh, are constantly having to fight or to do things in their brain to keep um the the primacy the moral primacy of, of russia uh, and keep that as a core belief in light of all this evidence that is massively contrary to the fact that these guys are in the moral right uh you know war crimes how do you deal with war crimes you deny them it's it's disinformation from ukraine it's this and that it's like load of rub or ukraine have done them so you get in the in the threads like instead of dealing with fifty thousand plus russian war crimes they say why don't you talk about the ukrainian war crimes and then they put post a video about um ukrainian drones with uh you know, chemical weapons. It's like, yeah, that's disinformation, a load of rubbish, and you're trying to deflect again. Like, deal with the accusations about, that's called what aboutery. It's like, yeah, it's like, you're a murderer. Yeah, but what about that person murdered over there? No, no, you're still a murderer. Yeah, yeah, but that person over there. No, no, that person might still be a murderer over there, but you are a murderer. How do you, how can you explain that moral uh, situation? So, so stop talking about stuff over there and deal with your own issues here, uh, especially when your own issues far outweigh those of the what aboutery that you're trying, right? So when you say look at you, you say to these pro Russians look at the look at the war crimes you've done and they say yeah but look at the war crimes that Ukraine have done okay they might have done a couple but it pales into insignificance compared to yours. So anyway that that's my side rant. Goodness I have forgotten even what I was talking about. Oh yeah like people defenestration people falling out of windows and falling onto bullets uh of hunting rifles <sighs> uh so china <laughs> right 
This has been big news the last few days. Uh, how long have I been banging on? Jeez. Right. Uh, the US has recently begun seeing disturbing signs that Beijing wants to creep up to the line of providing lethal military aid to Russia without getting caught. US officials have been concerned enough that they have been sharing this intelligence with allies at Munich. So this has been a really big thing the last few days. CNN reported uh, last month that the US raised concerns with China about evidence suggesting Chinese companies have sold non-lethal equipment to Russia for using Ukraine like helmets. But there are signs now Beijing is wearing lethal aid like weaponry, officials say. So the CNN article pretty much uh, pretty much said most of what it says there. Um, they they're sort of wanted to creep up to line. And I've, I've talked about this in a number of times previously, which is I'm fairly sure China are providing as much as they can under the radar bar major weaponry and you know whether i i suggested previously that it might even be pr providing ammunition via north korea or at least allowing north korea to make stuff helping north korea make stuff and then north korea sending that to to um russia and that's there maybe a way around it uh the officials would not describe in detail what intelligence the u.s has seen to suggest a recent shift in chinese china's posture but they've been concerned enough that they have been sharing the intelligence with allies and partners in the Munich at the Munich Security Conference over the last several days, the officials said. So this is worrying. They're genuinely, they're, you know, if we can believe this, which are uh, no reason not to. They are the Americans are sharing intelligence, and China are like pushing the envelope here uh, with with other uh, allies. We are, and this is uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, um, we are troubled that Beijing has deepened its relationship with Moscow since the war began. Uh, looking ahead, any steps by China to provide lethal support to Russia would only reward aggression, continue the killing and further undermine a rules-based order. Uh, the Biden administration last month raised concerns at China with China about evidence suggesting Chinese companies have sold non-lethal equipment to Russia for use in Ukraine, according to to U.S. officials. The equipment has included items like flak jackets and helmets. Multiple sources familiar with the U.S. and the European intelligence told the C told CNN. China has stopped short of a more robust military assistance, however, including lethal weapons systems for use on the battlefield in Ukraine. Russia has requested such aid, but China has not wanted to see be seen as a pariah on the world stage, officials said. Now, China is, is able to kind of talk out both sides of their mouth here because it's a bit like Turkey. They, they recognise that... Well, let's go back. So I, I've long said that China doesn't mind if Russia loses a war. I think China would gain more if Russia loses a war because they'll go and pick up all the pieces, have a... Have a a dip into the Russian natural resources may even state claims on the eastern provinces. Although there's an, uh, somewhat of an ideological alignment between the two nations, I, I don't think China really cares about that. It's more about power rather, rather similar to actually to Russia, I would argue. So they are helping Russia as much as they can whilst not going too far to annoy the rest of the world because actually a they don't mind if russia lose and b if they help russia too much then there's a chance that they would have sanctions put against them now china do far less business with russia than they do with the rest of the world so if china were hit with sanctions and they're on a precipice of an economic collapse possibly themselves have been for a long time say many analysts uh that that any kind of sanctions like that could send them into a downward spiral. So they are, they will be very reticent to show open military support for Russia. However, you know, if they can get away with showing as much support as they can that will allow them to get cheap oil and gas, uh, while the West don't sanction them, then they're probably going to do that. They're going to do that whilst at the same time saying, yeah, Russia don't use nuclear weapons. Yeah, we respect the kind of territorial integrity of some of these places in the Donbass or whatever. Whatever their positions are, they're, they're kind of like very carefully treading that line between uh, between the, the, the two factions. But of course... They are a member of BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And they are seeking this axis between those nations. And that now includes Iran, I would guess. They they are seeking to be the alternative um, 
set up to US and US allies. So it's that Eurocentric, um, US centric worldview where they see the this other axis with themselves at the center as a hegemon, as a, like the supreme power um, or, or global power. And we're going to come on to speak about that uh, in a little bit more detail in a second. But let's have a little look about to see what Phillips O'Brien says about this China situation. So there was a lot to Blinken. So Blinken's come out and said, made a claim that he has met the top Chinese official for the first time since the spy balloon drama. Uh, there's a lot to Blinken saying this publicly that needs to be unpacked. The first reason is the USA must be very concerned that China is actually going to supply significant military support to Russia. So far, most have said that China is more was more helping around the edges. The second thing is that this indicates that China must believe that the Russian army is in a terrible shape and desperately needs aid. The China, well, This is a really good point, and actually it's almost so obvious that it's overlooked. This is really super important. Russia wouldn't be asking China for such aid if everything was fine. If there's a second greatest army in the world, hey, we can cope with Ukraine. Okay, we're fighting NATO. Uh, but we're still like X, Y, and Z. Ah, oh, we've been beaten like, quite a lot over the course of this war are. So the reality is, I would argue that Russia are in a really dire military situation with in terms of capability and capacity. So the fact that there there's this intelligence that China is perhaps going to up their support for Russia is an indication that Russia needs that support. I mean, it's, it's, it's that obvious. And if they need that support, it's because they're, the Russian army is quite here is in terrible shape and desperately needs aid. The Chinese are assumed to be studying how effective sanctions can be if the US order sticks together. And this is how important it is to, to have these sanctions work, be effective, and for everyone, as many people to adhere to them as possible. The more people that, that, that hold to the sanctions, the more effective sanctions are. And the more effective these sanctions against Russia are, the more reticent China will be to overstep the mark because they will understand that the, the rest of the world or the West or allies or whoever are, are, are willing to put their money where their mouth is in terms of, of upholding these sanctions. Third, and this is really important because a major and regular supply of Chinese military products would be a real benefit to Russia. Russian domestic production seems to be woefully inadequate to make up for Russian losses. And a little bit more on this in a second. China can produce far more. I would go so far as to say that the only way Russia can wage a long war is with significant Chinese support in both finished munitions, spare parts and specialised components such as microchips. I've said this previously. So I said Russia cannot win this war. And I said that since April last year when I wrote an article saying uh, Putin can't win this war. The only way he could win this war is if China got involved. That is, to me, the only way. I mean, you could say someone like, I don't know, India getting involved or someone else. But re realistically, it's going to be China. So the only way that Russia could win this war is if China get involved. And, and really, that's how important this kind of decision, this this geopolitical these geopolitical machinations involving China are because actually if China do overstep the, the the mark and cross that red line we've got a war between the kind of the axis of Russia China etc against the rest of the world and there's an awful lot of the world who have been sitting not doing an awful lot just watching saying this war is in ours you know Africa South America Asia uh, to a large extent looking on going eh, who are they going to side with and so you know you don't want it to get to that point um interestingly and perun talks about this i so advise everyone go and watch perun's uh, latest video which is um about uh, russia's grand strategy in ukraine but when you look at everyone who's asked around the world who would you rather have as the world leader basically us or china like no one really votes for china uh, sorry, US or, or Russia. No one really votes for Russia. And indeed, I'd wonder China as well. And and so, you know, it does make you wonder who, who people would side with who are sitting on the edges in, in a global conflict here. Um, 
The fourth, and says Phillips O'Brien, is that this will lead almost definitely to an escalation in the aid given to Ukraine. And one wonders if the Chinese decision makers are wondering whether this is worth this risk. If China basically throws in military, militarily with Russia, Western aid to Ukraine is increased. I mean, there'll be no choice there. It's like in for a penny, in for a pound. You'd, it, I mean, you'd, you'd have pretty much a world war or a proxy world war. Um, the fifth, the USA has to believe that the Chinese government is torn about how much military aid to give Russia. And by going public, they are trying to put maximum pressure on Beijing not to do this. It would be one of the most fateful choices of this war. So it bears watching absolutely 100%. Um, and, you know, looking at looking at russia's ability to make stuff it's interesting so here's some pictures that seem to have come to the fore just in the last day so this guy this put this source says t14 armata t90m pro of uh, bmt terminator uh, armored fighting vehicles in the assembly line of ural wagon zavod right so it looks like russia could be building these this is pretty interesting and is it bit of a stark contrast to what we what we believe about the russian production facilities and the ability to to build this stuff but but then you, you start doing a little bit of a closer look at these pictures and in the uh, threads just below this they are in in dutch so one guy says not a nut happens here there that uh, what's their has been there for a long time. I don't think there's much work being done on it. Wait for parts uh, that are difficult to deliver or something. And then, you know, the original poster goes on to say, yes, I come across articles from 2016 and 17 with similar photos. I think they drag back and forth here for photo reports. No staff, nothing at all. So no staff working on them. That's really interesting. Then this guy then replies... Um, an assembly line has several stages. You should be able to discover that logical structure somewhere. That is not the case here. Everything is mixed up. In addition, much here, much has been covered for unclear reasons, and the dust is thick here and there. It's more like storage. So you go back to these, and you're like, is this a production right line? Actually, no, it doesn't look like a production line. It looks like a storage has been put on hold because they don't have the parts to make the rest of these vehicles. And they've even covered up a bunch of stuff um, in certain areas. You know, why would they do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So... Uh, interesting yeah i would say russian production is in in trouble um otherwise we'd be seeing stuff like that on the front line if it wasn't in trouble you would be seeing t14 armatas and t90s in much greater numbers than we than we are now when we look at the the ukraine war at the moment this is a great article by mark hartling um who's former uh lieutenant general in charge of uh American forces in Europe. Uh, he says the, the Ukraine war is a slugfest that Ukrainians will win, and he he talks through the sort of the process of the war, um, and he says it's gone through five phases, and through each one, Ukraine's forces have significantly outperformed Russia's. Now, this isn't just a like. Uh, you know, Yahoo for Ukraine. This is trying to understand what's going on. Hope, you know, I think considering the size of Ukraine as a country compared to the size of Russia, second greatest army in the world, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Ukraine have been obviously massively helped by everyone else in the world, but they have outperformed Russia. That's just what's happened. Uh, especially when you look at these five phases. So in no small part because of military culture of adaptability, Russian forces continue to be hampered by lack of that very same culture, as well as by lack of leadership and initiative. Putin never officially announced his strategic goals. To try to understand what his generals might do, I tried to ascertain what those might be. He seemed to want, and uh, remember that because we're going to talk about that with regard to Perrin's uh, video in a second. He seemed to want regime change in Kyiv, the destruction of Ukraine's army, the subjugation of Ukraine's population, control of the Black Sea and Azov seaports, and perhaps of Moldova as well. It was obvious Russia didn't have the number of soldiers or, or the combined arms effectiveness to achieve Putin's ambitious war aims. Worse, Putin's army ignored one of the most important principles of war, unity of command. The generals planned an attack on nine different axes of advance, whew, but were never able to coordinate ample naval and air forces into a massed assault that combined arms uh, offensive. The war started on February 24th. It took about six weeks for phase one of Putin's campaign to fail. So basically, they just attacked on all these axes and then didn't do very well. 
Estimates vary, but up to 40% of frontline Russian combat units appear to have been mauled with supply lines and effective command decimated. I won't go into all that again, those supply lines and bogged down, mud, uh, trucks breaking down, railways blown up, etc., etc. Uh, on April the 18th, Putin launched a new Russian offensive in the east, the start of phase two of the war, which is, right, we're going to concentrate not on everywhere, we're going to concentrate on the east now. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it didn't, there was no meaningful adaptation and no attempt to learn hard lessons from earlier setbacks. Pieced together, low morale units were thrown into the fight with little planning, bad reconnaissance and ineffective battleship leadership. Uh, Ukraine, on the other hand, was not complacent. Its generals were fast learners and adaptive, and the Russian forces continued to suffer huge losses. Then phase three began in July through to September, and this was their large-scale withdrawal from Sumy and Kharkiv oblasts using small-scale counterattacks uh, directed at just the right locations, aided by a large-scale operation operational deception in the south. Um, Ukrainian special operations forces were also contributing significantly to this phase using stealth and disciplined operational security to ensure that Russia was embarrassed behind its own lines. For most of the summer, the Russians sustained casualties that far exceeded those suffered from the previous disastrous phase one and two. And then phase four began in late September when Putin announced that several of the partially occupied southern regions in Ukraine would undergo annexation. Uh, this was accompanied by Putin's order to mobilise an additional 300,000 troops for the fight. The referendums took place in the occupied territories, so on and so forth. And then it, it all kind of continued going badly. The mobilised troops were poorly uh, trained, rushed in, uh, improvised. Recruits are poorly trained and equipped, and Russian leadership was still lacking. So it all continued to go wrong. In contrast, Ukraine's actions during this period consisted of an impressively coordinated use of conventional forces that had successfully incorporated newly arrived Western weapons, most notably precision guided artillery and rockets. In addition, this phase featured more Ukrainian special operations activity and the continued use of territorial resistance fighters. And then since December, we've had phase six of this war. Though the front might not have moved much, there's been significant fighting. And and extensive casualties on both sides. This phase is best understood not as a stalemate, but as Ukraine struggling to survive a Russian onslaught. Putin continues his messy mobilisation and is sending fresh cannon fodder, or cannon meat, as the Russians call these wretches, as Ukrainian lines in uh, at Ukrainian lines in assault waves. Ukrainian generals have balanced limited but continuous counterattacks with an effective defence, while also being forced to allocate scarce air defence capabilities to protect civilians. Ukrainian forces are also continuing to conduct intelligence operations to identify targets that will likely strike in the, they will likely strike in the future. It's a delicate balance for the decision makers in Kiev. They are trying to hold the defensive lines while training and equipping their forces. So they're training and equipping people in Poland, in the UK, all over the place, in Germany. Uh, uh, they're trying to hold those defensive lines while training and equipping their forces with newly obtained advanced weapon Western material. Uh, that will make a qualitative difference in the looming counteroffensive. So there have been these five... Um, phases of the war and none of them have gone well for Russia but it, it, going back to the well, what are the objectives uh, again you just have to watch this Perun video it is so good Russia's grand strategy and Ukraine is Putin's war already a strategic failure and it is basically any of the metrics that you that you measure the war against that, that either Putin has explicitly said denazification demilitarization protecting the donbass all these things it's like more people have died in the donbass since he came to protect donbass than died in the donbass for the last 8 years okay they had an average of something like 7 people dying a year from shelling or something civilians sorry 7 civilians dying a year and now this year just in the in the donetsk alone i think it is something like 4177 and that's what they've admitted Right. So if he's trying to protect the Donbass, he's failed. Absolutely. So all of these metrics, you measure the the success of the Russian project here. All the metrics you can measure against show that Russia has massively failed and has no way of winning. It's just on a hiding to nothing. So it's trying to understand what's going on there. And I, I want to bring you back to something I, I talked about in my rant video from yesterday, which is a Primakov doctrine. Um, and the Primakov doctrine is this uh, doctrine that there can only be a unipolar hegemon in uh, in the world. It, in other words, the supreme power can only be you know located in one place. There can't be uh, 
multipolarity. There can't be the US being a really big superpower and the the so Soviet Union, Russia. So how does that work? And that's kind of the Primakov doctrine. And and this this is interesting. So I have dug up this Carnegie Endowment for International Peace piece. Um, good old homonyms, homophones. Uh, from 2019 right and this is fascinating to give you an insight into what russia is doing now right and and to see this piece saying well they wouldn't do that because that's too risky and they've gone and done that and it kind of shows that actually the primakov doctrine is probably holding firm even though it's like a doctrine from previous decades but i think it's what russia is still adhering to and not necessarily the Gerasimov doctrine or maybe it's sort of smashing together both okay so the carnegie a uh, piece starts with hybrid warfare has been associated with Russian chief of the general staff, General Valery Gerasimov, the guy that's now just been put back in charge of the Russian forces in Ukraine. Oddly enough, remember, this is this piece is from 2019. The author of the so-called Gerasimov Doctrine, a whole of government concept that fuses hard. So that's like army power and soft power. That's uh, hearts and minds power across the world across many domains and transfer, transcends boundaries between peace and wartime. Rather than a driver of Russian foreign policy, the Gerasimov Doctrine is an effort to develop an operational concept of Russia's confrontation with the West in support of the actual doctrine that has guided Russian policy for over two do decades, the Primakov Doctrine. So it could be that the Gerasimov Doctrine, which can kind of seep into peacetime, that information war in peacetime, uh, and meddling with with elections and so on and so forth that is still really an extension of the Primakov doctrine so named after former foreign and prime minister Yevgeny Primakov the Primakov doctrine posits that a unipolar world dominated by the United States is unacceptable to Russia and offers the following principles for Russian foreign policy when you start understanding that this is like the central component of of their in, this is like the mission statement of Russia for the last however many decades. When you understand that, everything kind of makes a lot more sense in how they go about doing foreign policy. So it says, Russia should strive toward a multipolar world managed by a concert of major powers that can counterbalance US unilateral power. In other words, you can have a unipolar world, but it's not America. Like America can't be a part of it. You. you but you could sorry you can have a multipolar world but america can't be part of it so you can have that's why BRICS comes into it so brazil russia india china uh south africa but russia's your mate as long as russia's main the main component of that russia should insist on its primacy in the post-soviet space and lead integration in that region so if it's going to be multipolar russia needs to be your number one player russia should should oppose nato expansion the record of the past two decades reveals several key themes about the role of hard power in Russia's foreign and military policy. Military power is the necessary enabler of hybrid warfare. So, yeah, you can have hybrid warfare and stuff like information space and information operations. But actually, the thing that enables that to happen, you still got to have your hard power. Hybrid tools can be an instrument of risk management when hard power is too risky. So if it's too risky to go into countries and attack them, then, you know, you use your hybrid tools. It can be too risky, costly or impractical. But military power is always in the background. Nuclear weapons are the foundation of the country's national security and the ultimate guarantee of its strategic independence. But they are not an instrument for risky endeavours. They ensure that other powers do not engage in such endeavours against Russia. The implementation of the Primakov Doctrine has been anything but reckless. Russia use, Russian uses of hybrid warfare and military power against Georgia in 2008 and Ukraine since 2014, as well as in Syria since 2015, have been calibrated to avoid undue risks. Yet the intervention in Syria has also highlighted the limits of Russian hard power and hybrid warfare. Russian hard power is insufficient to impose the Kremlin's preferred vision version of peace on Syria and Moscow lacks a vast economic and military resources to become a hegemon in the Middle East. So in the preamble, it finishes off by saying the key question for the Kremlin is whether to push for greater capabilities and take additional risks in pursuit of a more ambitious set of global aspirations or 
to continue to follow the Primakov doctrine and the careful practice of calculating the risks and benefits of a given course. New generations of Russian leaders, less mindful of the Soviet experience and overextension than the current generation of leaders, may be more influenced by the successes of Crimea and Syria, more inclined to take risks and more ambitious in their vision for Russia. How they address these ambitions and exercise Russian hard power will have major consequences for the future of Russia, Eurasia and the world. This is fascinating because basically, like, w w what option Russia chooses to do is obviously going to be super important. And we now know what Russia chose to do. Whether that was because they're just gross miscalculations, well, I suppose in spite of it being gross miscalculations, it is part of, the I think, this kind of, uh, uh, the ideal of the Primakov doctrine. Um, and then it ends here with, again, she, you know, fascinating, this 2019, let's see how this is translated now. The United States, for most of the Cold War period, aspired to be the hegemon in the Middle East. So the, the supreme power, the kind of the, uh, the political and economic power. Uh, with vast economic and military resources and a major commitment of political capital. Russia lacks the economic and military resources and is apparently so invested in its role as the indispensable nation capable of conducting dialogue with all major actors in the region that it constrains its ability to conduct, in effect, uh, to conduct effective diplomacy, which would require it to take sides. The leap from the indispensable nation to hegemon is too much for Russia to cover even with its improved hybrid and hard power resources. This is where Perun's video is really very good. So he does a bit of historical um introduction to the to the video to by looking at where Russia's come from and how before you know before not too long ago sort of 70 80 years ago it had a bigger population than the US it had a, a much more viable economy that was growing at a faster rate and I think Russia may look back to those times and think you know since then it all went wrong but but they still have this feeling that they're this great nation that that has this power and has this population that can feed that power, and they they just uh, they just haven't been able to join that together. Their their economic um, policies have just not not worked in their favour, uh, but they still I think they still have that leftover belief in them, which leads them to make these these decisions that that. To, to you and I look ridiculous but to them it's part of their identity of who they are and, and their place in the world. In Europe and Eurasia geography, history and politics present Russia with undisputed advantages that effectively serve as force multipliers for its hard and hybrid capabilities. In more distant locale their utility is diminished. In many such situations like Syria or Libya Russia has been able to assert, insert itself as a party whose interests have to be taken into account but it is but it has so far been unable to impose its preferred solutions. The key questions for the Kremlin now are whether to push for greater capabilities and a bigger role in the Middle East and on the world stage or to be content with remaining an indispensable nation to take greater risks or to continue the practice of carefully calculating the risks and benefits of a given course, to follow the Primakov doctrine or to pursue a more robust set of global ambitions. There have been occasional hints that some in the Russian national security establishment are harbouring such ambitions, but there is little concrete evidence to suggest that the Kremlin is prepared to act on them. Hmm. Russia's far-flung engagements in Venezuela and the Central African Republic in Libya are more indicative of its agility and ability to seize opportunities when they arise than of a long-term muscular pursuit of a global agenda. The risks thus far have been modest and appear calculated, while the long-term benefits have yet to be realised. The older generation of Russian leaders, like Putin, cannot help but be mindful of the experiences of the Soviet Union, its arms race with the United States, the quagmire in Afghanistan, and the ambitious schemes that reached faraway corners of the map. However nostalgic they may be for the former glory of the Soviet Union, their posture so far has been careful, calculating, and risk-averse. What's fascinating there is that, that Ukraine was the exact opposite of that, which is this kind of harking back to um you know the, the the former glory of the soviet soviet union as they would see it 
Um, but new generations of Russian leaders may, may be less mindful of Soviet history and instead may be more heavily influenced by the successes of Crimea and Syria, more inclined to take risks and more ambitious in their global vision. How they handle their ambitions and their challenges will have major consequences for the future of Russia, Eurasia and the world. Absolutely dead on. So what's happened is it appears that Putin himself has done that, has been far less risk averse and be very risky possibly due to miscalculations. You could even bring in health issues and the fact that he's on the shed load of steroids by the looks of it and he's been visited by the cancer doctor like 132 times in a year or whatever it is. Uh, he appears to be have Parkinson's as well, all this kind of stuff. But if he's on steroids, then he's going to more likely to be more aggressive and take risky riskier actions as well as Parkinson's. Also, that's part of the things of early early Parkinson's. So there are these, these health issues that could even have an impact on the kind of decision making that he has been a part of or has been re responsible for. And then, you know, the Primakov doctrine and, and seeing Russia's place in the world um, and, you know, seeing taking the hybrid hybrid warfare but also this idea of military might which which is a miscalculation because actually due to corruption Varanya and all these other ideas the the military wasn't actually there and wasn't as good as they thought it was but they thought it was all of these miscalculations ideas of what Russia is taking big risks go into go into Ukraine and then it all falls apart but it all falls apart then these the discussion about well where do you go from here where do, where does putin go from here how does that how where's the get out here what are the options that he has um discussion for another day but uh, i would say definitely go and watch Perun's video it really is very good um that was just me rambling i hope hopefully that was of interest uh uh thank you for <laughs> for putting up with me uh please like subscribe and share um, and I will uh, speak to you tomorrow on more R Ukraine war news. Take care.